Um, so hello and welcome everyone. Uh, many thanks for joining us tonight um, for logging on. Uh, my name is Alan and I am the manager of the Northern Atlantic War Memorial Museum. Uh, tonight's talk, the 34th Red Bull Infantry Division at War, is the first uh, in a series of events that the War Memorial are planning to mark um, or host throughout the year to mark the 80th anniversary of the arrival of American forces in Northern Ireland and their subsequent impact upon the country and the local people and so on. So before I introduce our partners from the Minnesota um, Military and Veterans Museum, um, I first want to welcome a very special guest, um, uh, Paul Narain, and the US Consul for Belfast, who's going to give us a very quick welcome. Paul. Thank you so much. I really appreciate the uh, invitation to join you tonight. Uh, I'm really delighted to be able to speak to everyone. I really think this is a, an extraordinary and a really special series, and um, I really appreciate you giving me the opportunity to address everyone uh, here in uh, Northern Ireland and uh, at home. Today, we mark an important milestone in our shared history, and it's my honor as U.S. Consul General to be here in Belfast to join you to celebrate and honor that occasion. In 1918, Milburn Henke was born into a farming family in McLeod County, Minnesota. The year after he enlisted, and barely a month after the attack on Pearl Harbor, Private First Class Henke was on a voyage bound for the European Theater of Operations. 80 years ago today, that young serviceman descended the gangplanks here at Duffer and Docks in Belfast. He was part of the 34th Red Bull Infantry Division. His arrival marked our first official combat soldier to land in Europe in World War II. Northern Ireland's geographic location was of vital strategic importance to the United States. Crucial in the Battle of the Atlantic, it also provided a staging area for our forces as they prepared for combat elsewhere. Over a quarter of a million American soldiers followed Milburn Henke in preparation for the Allied effort in Europe. And their presence was as short-lived as it was dramatic. Yet many, many of our servicemen left here with profoundly positive memories of their hospitality and the kindness of spirit that was demonstrated by the Northern Ireland community. And it's a spirit and a hospitality that I continue to see every day uh, in my five, six months here of service. Today's anniversary really gives us all a chance to reflect, to, to reflect on those who have made extraordinary sacrifices in the defense of our shared liberties. So really this evening, it, it's my delight to be here with historians from both sides of the Atlantic who have come together to offer insights on the 34th Infantry Division's legacy, not just here, but in North Africa and in Italy as well. And I do wanna thank you, Alan, and your team at the Northern Ireland War Memorial Museum, as well as the many local groups here in Belfast and at home in the US who work hard to preserve the legacy of what is a truly formative and turbulent period in our shared history. So with that, I'm gonna say thank you to all of you for making this event uh, possible and really for allowing me to be a part of it. I'm really delighted and look forward to an, uh, an interesting evening conversation. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much, Paul. Um, truly appreciate taking the time to join us tonight. And, and also thank you very much for those kind words as well. Um, thank you. Um, so what I'd like to do, I'd like to pass over to our partners at in, currently in Minnesota, where I believe it's just shortly after one o'clock in the afternoon. Um, I want to introduce you to Doug Thompson, curator of the Minnesota Military and Veterans Museum, um, who's going to give us a brief overview of the history of the 34th Infantry Division and their preparations for war and then their time spent and their experiences in Northern Ireland. Doug? Yeah, can you hear me? All good, yep. All right, so uh, welcome everybody. Um, good evening to our friends in Northern Ireland and good afternoon to our friends in Minnesota where we uh, woke up to about um, about the same temperatures that the 34th Division um, experienced when they left Minnesota to go to Camp Claiborne in 1941. It's about 20 degrees below zero outside right now, but nice and warm in here. Um, hopefully you're, 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 you're having better weather in Northern Ireland today. So um, I do have some prepared um, texts. Gonna, this is my dog. Um, we do have some prepared texts on um, 
how the 34th division was formed. Um, I'll be talking about a little bit about the mobilization and the, the time at Camp Claiborne down in Louisiana, uh, their trip over to Northern Ireland. And uh, being a museum curator, naturally, I'm gonna have a lot of images of, of artifacts in our collection um, that are related to that time in Northern Ireland that I hope you, you all will, will, um, will enjoy. So I'm gonna share a screen here and start off with some, uh, um, some images um, to go through because I like images, so. Be patient with me as I as I as I fumble my way through this. So, all right, all right. So, um, World War One, uh, the 34th Infantry Division is born. Um, you know, obviously, World War One started in Europe in August of 1914. Uh, the United States was initially determined to stay out of the war. We didn't want to become involved um, in a in a in a European conflict. However, in June of 1916, probably Problems along the border with Mexico caused President Wilson to activate many units of the National Guard, including Minnesota's three infantry and one artillery regiment. Uh, they were sent to a, a place called Lano Grande, Texas, on the Mexican border to assist the regular army in um, stopping cross-border raids by a Mexican revolutionary um, named Pancho Villa. Uh, the Minnesotans patrol the border engaged in no combat, but received valuable training and preparation for future events. Uh, by February of 1917, the Minnesota National Guard was home. Um, later, a couple months later, on, on April 6th, 1917, the United States declared war on Germany. Uh, so through the spring and summer of 1917, uh, Minnesota Guardsmen were again called to federal service. These Minnesotans, along with other um, units from Iowa, Nebraska, and the Dakotas, were sent to Camp Cody near Deming, New Mexico. And on the 15th of July, 1917, uh, the 34th Infantry Division was born. Um, here, the units received new federal designations. For example, the 1st Minnesota became the 135th Regiment, uh, who would play a part in, in Northern Ireland later on. The 2nd Infantry became the 136th, and the 3rd Infantry became the 125th Field Artillery. To the disappointment of the division, the 34th was used to train and provide replacements to other divisions going overseas. At the same time, drafted replacements were sent to the division from around the country. By mid-summer of 1918, the 34th had lost much of its Minnesota and, and Iowa Corps. Um, as most of these men were being sent over um, as replacements for other units over in Europe. Uh, and in September uh, of 1918, the division was actually made it to France, um, but the division again was, didn't have any units save for one uh, that were, were actually sent into combat. They were using the 34th um, uh, piecemeal kind of to grab replacements to fill out casualties and other divisions. Uh, the origins of the 34th division patch. Uh, you wouldn't, wouldn't think a Minnesota unit would have a patch with a, a red steer skull and a, a Mexican water bottle, um, water container. But um, uh, during, most of, during World War I, most of the Army's divisions designated and signed, designed and signed to help build unit pride um, in 1917. The 34th held a competition to design a unit insignia. Uh, a young man from Iowa submitting the wedding design, uh, which featured things that were really common in the Southwest desert where they had been stationed at that time. Um, a red steer skull superimposed in a Mexican water jug called an Ola. Now originally, and actually here's the original plans for the, the first insignia. Um, Originally, the 34th weren't called the Red Bulls, they were called the Sandstorm Division, and that reflected the, the um, uh, physical environment that the 34th Division was training on down in New Mexico. So, um, and, 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 and one of our, our prize items in our collection is, here it is, here's one of the first Red Bull patches ever made. It actually came from 
the World War I commander of the 151st Field Artillery named a guy named George Leach. So this is one of probably the first 50 to 100 Red Bull patches ever made. And uh, uh, as far as we know, it's, it's probably the only one in existence today. Um, another a Red Bull patch from the time. Uh, they weren't very standardized. They had a lot of different sorts of patches that they were making. Here we see the 34th with the SD for the Sandstorm Division on it. Um, and our museum has a, a fairly decent collection of, of, of these sorts of patches. Uh, New Mexico, there are, uh, if you look at this photograph closely, you'll see that there are over 16,000 men in this photograph. Um, obviously, they're, 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 they're making a big emblem of the, the, the Red Bull insignia. And uh, I think probably the, the entire division got together for that photograph. You know, with, 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 for those of you that have kids, um, I've got four kids and getting them all together in one place for a photograph can be challenging. I wonder how they were able to do it with <clears throat> 16,000 men there. Um, again, the only 34th Division unit that, that saw action as a, uh, as a cohesive unit over in France was 151st Field Artillery, and they were attached to uh, General Douglas MacArthur's 42nd Rainbow Division. Um, here we have a picture of the 151st uh, crossing over into Germany in December of 1918 um, as they were going to do occupation duty in Germany at the end of the war. Between the wars, um, after World War I, um, federalized soldiers were mustered out of the army. National Guard units that had been ordered to federal service could not yet legally be returned to the service of the state. Uh, the 34th Division headquarters was returned to the Midwest to be composed of units from Minnesota, Iowa, and South Dakota. Uh, by 1920, units were being reformed under the division. The 151st Field Artillery, the 135th Infantry and a field ambulance company were the first formed for the new uh, Minnesota National Guard Division. By 1925, the 125th Field Artillery had reformed and rejoined the 34th. Um, and this expansion continued on into the 1920s and 30s. And here we have a picture of some soldiers, the 1930s at Camp Ripley um, with some of their field gear. Uh, training at Camp Ripley um, involved these members of the machine gun company of uh, the 135th Infantry Regiment. Um, so in addition to the weekly four-hour drills, guardsmen were required to attend one 15-day period of annual training. In the 1920s, this was usually conducted at Camp Lakeview on the shores of uh, Lake Pepin in southeast Minnesota. But in 1931, construction started on the new National Guard facility up here, um, go to Camp Ripley, at Camp Ripley. Uh, they initially purchased 12,000 acres of land to build this new camp. Um, today, it's at about 58,000. And here they are building the front gates to, to, to Camp Ripley. And uh, here's a comparison photo of, of what it looks like today. It hasn't changed much, although the, um, the capacity of the guard has changed quite a bit. Uh, during, the, the Aug during August of 1937 and 1940, with threats of war in Europe and Asia, the 34th Division participated in a large scale army maneuvers um, in the central Minnesota area, uh, including Camp Ripley and some of the surrounding towns. Um, these maneuvers highlighted one thing, and that was that the National Guard was short on training and equipment. Um, we had General George C. Marshall at the time uh, visit the Camp Ripley, um, saw the capacity of the 34th Division, and, and realized that um, the, the National Guard needed a, a lot of revamping. Um, so on August 27th, those exercises ended, and Congress authorized the um, federalization of over 300,000 National Guard troops. Uh, the fall of 1940 was spent preparing for mobilization. 
Um, er, as early as October, units were alerted on nine separate occasions for induction into federal service. This caused quite a confusion in the personal lives of the men who, you know, a lot of them quit jobs or school. They, they had to end um, leases. They, they had, had to make plans for their families. So um, uh, most of the division was designated and moved to Camp Claiborne, Louisiana. Uh, the two division, two division elements uh, were to mobilize separately. One of them was a 109th Aero Observation Squadron, whose commander, um, Ray Miller, is uh, featured in the center. And here are pilots and staff officers. The 109th Aero Observation Squadron was the first National Guard um, Aero Squadron to be assigned to a National Guard division. So um, the 34th Division um, led the way for all the other National Guard units to have um, an aerial, an aerial component to it. Uh, the other unit that was um, um, sent away was Company A of the 194th Tank Battalion. And uh, this was the first National Guard unit to actually have a tank company as well. Um, a Company of the 194th Tank Battalion was sent over to the Philippines in 1941 um, as America's only armored unit um, overseas at the start of the war. Um, later on, they would um, um, fight a desperate rearguard action in the Philippines to, to hold off the Japanese advances in the Philippines. Um, and of the 60 men in the company, only 30 came home. The rest either died in combat or uh, um, were, were, were prisoners of the Japanese. So. So arriving in Camp Claiborne, uh, the Minnesotans found the camp barely finished and full of red Louisiana mud. Um, oh, and a little bit here on Camp Claiborne. Camp Claiborne was built, at, built on uh, the Kasachi National Forest in central Louisiana. It composed 23,000 acres. Um, camp Claiborne was built between September and December of 1940. They had 8 thousand workers building hundreds of wooden structures, thousands of tents at a, at a cost um, at the time of over $14 million. Um, Camp Claiborne, if it were built today, would have cost a quarter of a billion dollars, but they had to build these camps fast to help with the federalization of the, of the National Guard units. Um, the 34th Division was the first unit to garrison Camp Claiborne. And here, here are some pictures. I'm going to show you some slides from uh, um, our collections of different units of the 34th Division uh, on parade going to Camp Claiborne. Uh, the, the, the 34th Division brought all of their, their artillery. Um, a lot of the troops took train. A lot of troops took to, um, the train down to Louisiana. Um, well, you had a lot of uh, uh, members of the unit that were driving trucks and their artillery units and all that. So here we have the 151st Field Artillery on parade, uh, the 135th Infantry, which would spend time in Northern Ireland, uh, more units um, of the 134th. Here are the, all the divisional colors together on parade. Uh, fortunately, over the years, our, our museum has been able to acquire and, uh, and have in our collections a lot of the original colors that were flown flown at Camp Claiborne and in Northern Ireland. So here's um, a headquarters flag from the 175th in our collections. Here's the um, national color of the, the 135th Infantry, 175th HQ, uh, another field artillery, uh, 175th flag. And Camp Claiborne, um, beautiful, Camp Claiborne. I think um, uh, I think there was a lot of um, um, pr problems down at Camp Claiborne. Most of the troops when they first got there um, lived in tents. There was hot. It was, there were a lot of mosquitoes. There was mud. There was bad weather. But um, like all good soldiers, they they put up with it as best they could. Here are some um, images of uh, Camp Claiborne with the original. Uh, tents, and here are the tar paper shacks they eventually lived in, uh, the sleeping quarters, not unlike the Nissan, the Nissan huts that the soldiers got 
uh, to um, stand when they were in Northern Ireland. Here's um, uh, part of the 34th Division on review. When they first got there, again, it was a mess. It was muddy. Um, they were sleeping in tents. Uh, it was um, a, a lot of organization that had to take place before they were able to make the camp livable. Some more uh, images of the, the sleeping quarters. Um, here's a gentleman that the Northern Ireland War Museum actually interviewed. Um, we introduced them to a man named Fred Topol. Um, and Fred was kind enough to uh, donate a lot of his materials to our museum, including a photo album with a lot of pictures of him over at Camp Claiborne. So. The mess hall. Camp Claiborne. Uh, here, here's an overhead view of the camp. Amazing that it only took three months to build this massive sprawling camp. Uh, one of three camps that were actually built in, in central Louisiana during the, um, um, the, the maneuvers there. Uh, the 34th Division's area was mostly on the left in the photograph. And uh, they had about 4,000 soldiers, I believe there at the camp so uh sports were sports um as, as well as the war maneuvers um sporting events to keep the guys in shape and to keep up the morale were really important and we're happy to say that battery e of the 151st field artillery were camp claiborne softball champs in 1941 so Another picture of uh, some 34th Division trucks, 151st Field Artillery trucks uh, on maneuvers out in the field. Um, just within the last week, the Minnesota Military Museum received a donation of most of the photographs and paperwork of a guy named Colonel George Sylvester, who commanded the 151st Field Artillery. And I just pulled these images out the other day. They're um, um, color photographs that um, Colonel Sylvester had of training in, in Camp Claiborne. And there's 151st Field Artillery Regimental Standard along with the U.S. flag. Some more so pictures of soldiers on training. There's Colonel Sylvester on his command vehicle. Uh, here's, a, here's an artifact from Camp Claiborne. as a sweater worn by a member of D Company, the 135th. And a couple of steel helmets, uh, the one on the left from the 125th Field Artillery and the right on the 135th Field Artillery. Now, when the 34th Division went over to Northern Ireland, um, a lot of uh, talk was made about them being dressed in World War I uniforms. Now, they had the, uh, the, the World War I helmets when they went to Northern Ireland. Uh, the Quartermaster Corps had the new helmets available but um, they didn't want to uh, cause any identification issues with the US troops. They didn't want to confuse any of the, um, so they said they didn't want to confuse any of the British soldiers by having um, German type helmets, which they thought the, US, the newer US helmets looked like. So they, um, they, they let them go overseas uh, um, with the World War I doughboy helmets. Uh, here's a picture of Colonel Sylvester at Fort Dix before they, um, got on the boats to go to Northern Ireland. And here we have pictures uh, taken from Colonel Sylvester's album that I had never seen before, but they're pictures of the 34th Division um, traveling on, a, on, on this HMTS straight there over to, to Belfast. So I think a fairly rare set of uh, photographs. So, and there's uh, the HMTS straight there obviously um, the first uh, transport ship to land in Northern Ireland. And there's a, a painting that we have of the straight there in the museum. And here is the Aquitania, which also took um, troops of the 34th over to Northern Ireland. All right. Uh, the first U.S. Army unit in Europe. Um, after war was declared, units of the 34th were sent to guard southern coastal facilities from Florida to Texas. 
Um, as much as possible, unit commanders try to rotate as many soldiers home for Christmas leave. Uh, but because of the 34th excellent performance in the 1941 maneuvers and its high state of training, it was selected to be the first unit to Europe. The first week of January 1942, units were recalled from their guard duties. And the transportation of the units to Fort Dix started. <clears throat> Fort Dix wasn't really ready to receive the 34th and the troops were quartered in tattered, unheated tents, a lot of times with no beds and below zero temperatures. Uh, January 14th, the first units arrived in New York uh, on the, on the H, uh, HMS, um, HMTS Strathaird. I hope I'm pronouncing that right. And then on January 26th, 80 years ago today, uh, the first man off the boat uh, was Milburn Hankey. Now, Milburn came from a small town called Hutchinson, Minnesota. And as Minnesota kind of has a, a, a reputation as being um, a, a state with a lot of a, a high Norwegian population, Scandinavian population, the, the fact is that most Minnesotans, uh, the largest ethnic group were actually Germans. And so um, I think it's interesting that these young men who were, were first and second, second generation Americans of families that were were German, were some of the first ones off the boat to, to go over to, to help, you know, fight Nazism. So here's the famous picture of Milburn Hankey getting off the boat. When, when uh, Milburn was over in Europe, um, especially at the camp in, in Northern Ireland, um, he was kind of a magnet for photographers. He had photographers following him everywhere. They wanted to document this young man who um, was the first one overseas. I'm sure you, um, a lot of you have seen a lot of these pictures before, but I'm gonna just scroll through these pictures of, of, of Melbourne in uniform. A really good looking guy, the kids loved him. Um, here's some Irish kids um, uh, hanging around the, 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 the Yank Guardian Division headquarters. Uh, nice, nice smile on the guy. You can see why he was a, a favorite of the photographers and, uh, and uh, a, a real good ambassador for the American soldiers over in, in Northern Ireland. Uh, Milburn's original um, uh, discharge papers from the Army, um, and I'm sure uh, our next presenter will, will, may comment on the fact that Milburn Hankey went home in 1944 after he's badly injured after a weapons carrier rolled over him, over him in Italy. Um, he got to go home, um, start up the family business again, and, uh, and enjoy the rest of his life. So, uh, One of the prize um, articles we have for the 34th Division in our collection is the uniform of Milburn Hankey. Uh, after he had passed, his, his widow, Iola, um, made a point of bringing up everything that she had of his from his time over in Europe and uh, um, let, us, let us have it for our collections. And uh, when we build our new facility, we, we plan on having a Milburn's uniform on display, um, which we think is a real, a real prize. So um, he was on a lot of different magazine covers over in Europe. Um, here's, a, here's a few samples. I'm sure you probably have these in your collections at the the Northern Ireland War Memorial. I've 34th Division guys when they got to Europe. Uh, number one, they were happy to get off that transport boat and being family guys themselves who, who missed their families, I think they had a real affinity for the children that they were able to meet over in Northern Ireland. And of course, I'm um, having a, a, a beautiful um, lady serving you food and, and tea is, was, was a reason to put a smile on their faces too. <clears throat> uh, another famous Minnesotan that, that came over to the, with the 34th in Northern Ireland was a sergeant in the 125th field artillery named John Vesey. Uh, John Vesey, as many of you know, uh, rose from the ranks, got a battlefield commission at Anzio, and went on to become um, a four-star general and the, uh, and the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff under President Reagan. 
Here's a picture of John Vesey in the front of his, renting an Irish court, uh, horse cart and going for a ride. I love this picture of General Vesey and, and it shows them enjoying the, the beautiful countryside over there. And here's a picture of General Vesey in Camp Claiborne. Uh, you had your, your famous war photographer, uh, Bruce, I'm gonna I'm gonna butcher this name, but uh, Bruce Burns third. Somebody can help me out on that. Uh, what one of John Vesey's good friends was a famed war correspondent and artist, Bill Malden. So Bill Malden uh, drew a picture of Vesey while he was over in uh, in Italy during World War II. Uh, the Last Man Club, a, a battery B, the 151st Field Artillery. Uh, in 1942, while stationed in Coleraine, Northern Ireland, a last man club was organized. This um, British 25-pounder shell, I'll get, you, get a picture of it, uh, was fired in a battery training in the Irish Sparren Mountains on February 21st, 1942. Uh, immediately after the training exercise, the casing was sent to a nearby jeweler where the names of all the men involved in that firing of that shell were, were engraved in that shell casing. Um, it was sent home, it actually went home with uh, Captain Gene Sertic, uh, the B battery commander, um, whose father whose father actually started a, a large liquor store chain in, in the Minnesota area. Um, and, that, and that bottle that was, that was um, from that shell pictured here is actually in our collections now. Uh, some of the whiskey has leaked out uh, um, over the years. It's evaporated. Um, I'm sure it's still pretty good. Um, and another prize collection in the uh, prize item in our collection. So, um, Albert Brunette, a Minnesota man from A Company, um, A Battery, the 151st Field Artillery, brought this guide on home. He uh, received a battlefield commission as well. Or actually, he came back to the United States, got a commission, went back and was unfortunately killed in, in Italy as a, a forward air observer, artillery observer. Uh, this is a collection that we just got the other day of um, um, Colonel Sylvester. We got a photo album of his time in Northern Ireland. You will remember on the, the movie, A Letter from Ulster, uh, he's the colonel that went up to the two young soldiers and admonished them for not writing home. So we have a lot of his um, artifacts now in our museum, including pictures taken in Northern Ireland, uh, meeting different generals at the time, General Marshall, uh, British General Franklin. Um, Bain's father, here we go. Here's the picture that um, uh, your famed war artist um, drew of. Uh, Colonel Sylvester, he actually drew pictures of a lot of 34th Division guys. He considered himself a, a part of the 151st Field Artillery when he was over there. Uh, different pictures of soldiers with their pictures drawn by Bruce Barron's father. Um, a, a book produced by Barron's father of uh, his time with 151st over in Northern Ireland. Uh, General Sil or Colonel Sylvester's uh, uh, British made compass that he used over in Northern Ireland, uh, officers of the 151st. Uh, the one thing that the, the, the soldiers that, um, that went to Northern Ireland commented on was the beauty of Northern Ireland. And um, they're all very, uh, um, very complimentary, mostly of the people that, that they met over there. I think uh, when the, the Irish um, people, uh, had the 34th in their homes and in their country um that they they um they were very well received and uh uh and uh they they, they love their time with the irish people um speaking of uh the the first shell fired in europe in world war ii um uh, against the germans was a b battery the 175th field artillery the forward artillery observer for that um gun crew that fired that shell was a guy named Fred Topol, who um, we introduced to the uh, staff at the Northern Ireland War Memorial, and they were able to interview Fred, who's still doing very um, very well. Here he is pictured at our, our, our 25 
pounder British field the artillery piece that we have our, at our museum. Um, here's Fred in 1941 at Camp Claiborne. He gifted us um, his uniform for our collections. Uh, Fred is turning 100 in May, and uh, I think he might he might possibly be um, the, one of the only. Uh, I think he might be the only American soldier that was in Northern Ireland, only member of the, the 34th, um, still alive today. And here he is with a shell casing from the first shell that American forces fired against Germany in World War II. And here he is looking um, on at a display case with some of his artifacts in it. Here he is with his, his family who got to spend some time with him and uh, got to hear some of dad, his, his war stories when we were interviewing him. Um, and here's B battery, the 175th firing that first shell against the Germans in World War II. And I'm, I see I'm running short on time, so I'm going to uh, um, close out here. Uh, some more artifacts from, from our collections related to the 34th uh, unit crest from the units that went over to Northern Ireland. Uh, the famous K rations we have on display with a nice Red Bull um, cigarette lighter. Propaganda po um, leaflets picked up on Northern Ireland, and I'm going to hold. I'm going to end off with uh, one of my favorite pictures taken from Northern Ireland. Go through these quick, and this is young Irish children uh, on the shoulders of these 34th Division guys, and and uh, in, enjoying their company as much as they're enjoying the company of uh, the soldiers that are carrying them. So. Wonderful. All right, I've gone on and on and on. Um, no, one no, that's, so, that's honestly, about all I have for my presentations. Was, that was, was really interesting. It was really nice to, to or good to hear from you. And the, it was a real honor actually to have a glimpse into your, your collections. Um, certainly from what you've sent me in the past, it was it's, it's remarkable what you've actually received quite recently within the last number of weeks as well. Um, those images of them crossing the Atlantic um as well as of the, from from Bruce Barron's father um also it's it's a real nice um donation it must be a real privilege to be able to work with those items on a, on a daily basis as well um it is it's it's really um fascinating to be able to touch this history firsthand and uh if there's um ever any images or anything like that that you guys are like for your museum in the future um I know um I know we'd be happy to scan those images and share those and make them available to you as well. So you just need to um, keep in touch with us and, and, and ask. So I, cer I certainly will. Um, not at all jealous. You get to work with uh, such a collection uh, at all. Um, what I'll do, what we'll do now um, is we'll pass. Randall, do you want to come in now and say a little bit about more about the museum and its 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 plans for the future before we pass on to Richard? I, I uh, thank you, um, and and thank you, Doug, for for sharing such a good perspective on our museum collection and the stories that we're working to tell. Um, I, I see someone in our audience that I recognize because he's he's wearing appropriately a sweatshirt that says Minnesota strewn across the chest, um, and that's Jack Johnson, who's a a former uh, partner in our museum and is a member as well. I don't know if Jack had anything he wanted to add. Uh, he's done an awful lot to get to the museum to the point where Doug now. Uh, is steward of what uh, Jack had put together years ago. Um, but I think Doug's final photograph there of, of uh, the Irish kids with the American soldiers is a great segue to perhaps, you know, hear from Richard uh, at this point as a segue. Um, so I would, I would pass the baton to him. Okay. That's fine. Um, you can see that okay, Alan? Yes, it's it's perfect, Richard, yep. That's fine. Uh, so no need for me to explain that this is the, the divisional badge or the tactical recognition flash, as we would call it on the side of the Atlantic of the 34th Infantry Division. Uh, fairly well known, of course, in Northern Ireland uh, because of its time in the province during the Second World War, uh, even though, as, as Douglas said, that was a fairly short uh, period here. Um, I'm actually treading back on some of the ground that, that, that Doug went over. 
because there's a there's an interesting connection. This is the the first shell that was fired in Northern Ireland. Uh, it was fired by gunners stationed in the Coleraine area and actually on the Bellarina estate. I'll see a photograph or two of the Bellarina estate in a moment. And uh, that was eventually, uh, and again, we've, we've also seen the photograph of the bottle of whiskey. Uh, the, the shell was given to a jeweler uh, in Coleraine. Uh, it was to be polished, it was to be engraved and so forth. It wasn't actually collected for an awful long time afterwards, but the bottle of whiskey, the Irish whiskey was, was in it. Now, the interesting thing about it is that the jeweler was a man called Dan Hall Christie. And when this happened in 1942, Dan Hall Christie's son, Jack, was commanding a light anti-aircraft battery of the Royal Artillery in North Africa and uh, would, would later become a, a, a colonel commanding officer of a, a, a light artillery regiment. And I, I met him a, a couple of times uh, in old age uh, and talked to him. Um, but I'd never known the story uh, about his father in the jeweler shop and the, uh, the engraving of the, that very first round. So there's a, a wonderful piece of history there um, and a connection with, with Coleraine. Sadly, uh, Jack Christie died way back in the 1980s and his son, Jack Christie, whom I knew quite well, uh, died about 10 years ago. The Bellarina estate uh, where some of the 151st Artillery Battalion were stationed and possibly the entire battalion with the British 25 pounder. The, the 25 pounder was an interesting weapon because it was a gun howitzer, so it could fire in the upper register above uh, an elevation of 45 degrees. And this looks to be a parade. And I'm wondering indeed if the, uh, the VIP party who are standing in the back of two trucks, which are reversed one up to the other, uh, probably includes Colonel Sylvester. Um, not sure about that because I don't have any identification for them. It'd be nice to think, in fact, that he, that he is present. Um, and I'm doing a, a bit of then and now. This is the uh, uh, Bellarina estate today. It actually belongs to um, a friend of mine who uh, was a, a very successful businessman, now retired, was the uh, Lord Lieutenant, the Queen's representative for County Londonderry, and uh, was a major in the Territorial Army. Uh, so I I'm planning to contact him and show him some of the some of the photographs of the 151st. He may already know about it, but it would be a nice connection to make. Uh, and uh, of course, just to bring us up to date, this is the 151st uh, in, in action today, and they've seen overseas service uh, since the start of this century, uh, as indeed of so many National Guard formations. Um, Tunisia was their first area of uh, operations. I, I'm not going to go into that in, in detail. Uh, Tunisia was uh, it tended to be a, a school for uh, the, the US forces who hadn't been in action before. And this, uh, the late Field Marshal uh, Earl Alexander, uh, an Irishman, actually an Ulster man from County Tyrone, uh, said of them, they learned very, very quickly. Uh, and learned, in fact, they, they, they did. The, the 34th was to prove a, a master at picking up the whole uh, ethos of combat and the um, outthinking the Germans in many, many cases. Uh, they moved across from uh, North Africa to Italy. They didn't take part in the Sicilian campaign, uh, but they landed at Salerno. And in fact, 151st uh, Artillery Battalion landed on D-Day, which was the 9th of September, uh, 1943. And there's a, another connection there, personal one for me. My father, also an artillery man, landed on the beaches at Salerno uh, on D-Day plus six. Uh, his artillery unit was instantly converted into Italy, uh, into infantry, because the, the Germans had launched a massive counterattack on Fifth Army and were trying to push them into, back into the sea. Uh, that didn't happen, uh, and uh, they, they went on to fight in a number of battles uh, up the, the, the spine, as it were, of Italy. Uh, so 34th Division gets a considerable 
uh, amount of experience in fighting in very, very hard conditions with the winter setting in, the Germans have established a belt of lines, a series of lines across the Italian peninsula, which they dubbed the Winter Line. There's a number of the, the Victor Line, uh, the Bernhard Line, uh, the Gustav Line, which is uh, part of the Bernhard Line, uh, the Barbara Line, uh, and so forth, and uh, the Hitler Line and the Cesar Line. Um, and uh, they come back up. If we look just back at the previous photograph, we've got two soldiers of the 34th uh, facing the Gustav Line at Casino. And this is the first battle of Casino, uh, which began um, on the 12th of January, 1944. Uh, many, many history books say it started on the 22nd. It didn't. Uh, it started on the 12th with the French Expeditionary Corps in Fifth Army attacking in the north of the line. Uh, 34th Infantry Division was in US II Corps. Uh, 36th Infantry Division was sent across the River Rapido in most histories inaccurately called uh, and inaccurately named the Rapido because it's really the Gary River. Uh, they have been, been talking about uh, the, the, the slide uh, number six, which is the two soldiers of 34th Infantry Division looking at a uh, bitterly cold uh, Monte Cairo. Now, Monte Casino uh, has the monastery on top of it, Monte Cairo looks down on Monte Cassino. And uh, this is uh, the objective in January 1944 for 34th Infantry Division, uh, reinforced by the 142nd Regiment from the 36th Infantry Division. And the today photograph, which is uh, the, the next slide, number seven, um, you can see in the, the foreground to it, uh, a very, very much smaller hill. That hill is, is called, uh, well, it was actually called Phantom Ridge at the time. And although it's not visible because the slide is so small, but just where I've got the arrow is the memorial to the uh, Polish 33rd Infantry Division. And uh, the, the, the um, guys who, who have been in, in action since uh, Tobruk in North Africa. Uh, so you can see how much Monte Cairo actually dominates everything. And in fact, one of, one of the veterans whom I knew very well, uh, later Major General Bala Breeden, told me that after, long after the casino battles in the summer of 44, he was able to climb to the top of Monte Cairo. And he said on, on a clear day as it was, he could actually see from Monte Cairo right down to the Bay of Naples, which is 60 miles away. So this is uh, the next slide, number eight, that's 34th Infantry Division soldiers going into action. They crossed the uh, Rapido River, and it is correctly the Rapido where they crossed north of the town. Their mission was to go into the mountains uh, to seize the, uh, the, the Phantom Ridge and um, the, 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 other, the other ridge, the, uh, which I've, I've, I've uh, forgotten the name of, Snake's Head Ridge, um, and get to the monastery on Monte Casino. Um, they, they failed in that, but in the time that they spent in action on that mountain, uh, they, they had tremendous uh, endurance. The weather conditions were abominable, freezing cold. These guys held out. They made many, many att attempts to try uh, to get to the monastery. Uh, when they were finally relieved by the 4th Indian Division, some of the soldiers were literally so cold that they had to be carried out. Uh, they couldn't move. They were, they were almost frozen, locked in position uh, in, in their slip trenches. So that, that's uh, an idea of the, the endurance and the, um, the perseverance that they showed. Um, they had already considerable experience fighting this, the, the next slide, slide nine shows, and I've got those slightly out of sequence, I should have shown that first, is uh, uh, as they fought their way through the mountains south of the, 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 the line, the, the German Gustav line. Um, again, a then and now photograph number 11. Uh, this is actually taken on uh, the Phantom Ridge just a few years back. Um, 
I've walked all of this ground, so I have a good idea of what these soldiers went through uh, and a tremendous appreciation for what they, they did go through. I have absolutely no doubt, uh, and I agree very much with Major Fred, Fred Madge Delaney, uh, who was there uh, in the 11th Brigade of 78th British Division with the 2nd Lancashire Fusiliers, that the one of the finest feats of arms of any soldiers in the Second World War was that of 34th Infantry Division uh, at Casino. Uh, in my book, the, the uh, performance of the division at Casino uh, stands and in fact exceeds that of uh, the guys who fought in the Battle of the Bulge. Uh, this was one division, it wasn't an army or a large part of an army, and they excelled themselves. This is some of the soldiers exhausted, one of them exhausted, uh, having some food, slide 12, slide 13 is uh, casualties being brought back. Um, I can't see most of slide 14, but it's uh, an image, if I'm correct, of looking down. Oh, I can see it now. Looking down uh, from Monte Cairo. I've not yet got to the very top of Monte Cairo, but I'm hoping before I pop my clogs that I will. Uh, and the ridge that you can see there is uh, Phantom Ridge which 34th Division took. Uh, beyond it, the other ridge that you can see is Monte Trocchio, which 4th, 34th Division had taken, although the Germans had actually abandoned it at the time. Monte Trocchio was then used as an observation post by the Allies. It was also uh, because it concealed, it was beyond the view of the Germans up on Monte Cairo. It was used to build up forces for the final battle of Casino uh, and obviously for briefing of officers on the ground situation and so forth. When I conduct uh, battlefield studies at Casino, I actually use Monte Trocchio as the, the ground setting exercise. Just to give you an idea of some of the, the conditions that they encountered, this is very, very typical of the ground at Casino. This is a, this is a hull, this is a face, a rock face that you have to get up. This photograph uh, taken uh, five years ago, uh, and you can see that there's still uh, ordnance lying about there uh, in various places. Uh, this, this was reported to the, uh, the Italian army who would come along later and remove it, so hopefully it's not there today. Uh, I mentioned the 142nd uh, Regiment of 36th Division, which was added to 34th uh, for this expedition into the mountains and the attempt to take uh, the, the monastery, monastery hill. Uh, and this is a memorial uh, to one of their soldiers uh, who died uh, up in the, in the mountains uh, above Casino and overlooking actually uh, Phantom Ridge. Um, soldier of uh, 142nd, who, a friend of mine, uh, Damiano Paravano, who lives uh, not very far away and studies the battlefield, walks the battlefield, and guides me around the battlefield, uh, discovered uh, this soldier's dog tags about 10 years ago and eventually arranged to have this memorial placed to him on the, uh, on the ground where he, in all likelihood, lost his life in 1944 during that uh, attack into the into the mountains. Uh, 34th Division would go on then to fight in the breakout from Anzio. They moved into the Anzio bridgehead in uh, March of 1944. Uh, still a very, very difficult time, although the worst of the German attacks to pinch out the, the lodgement had finished by then. Uh, but they took part in uh, Operation Buffalo uh, and then the, the switch of axis uh, by General Mark Clark towards Rome, and uh, then fought off towards the, the Gothic line. Uh, they had a superb divisional commander in Charles Ryder, and uh, I think he was both inspiring and a man with a, an eye for battle and an eye for the, the, the ground. By the end of the war, I think 34th Division had actually spent more days in combat uh, in the European theater than any other. Uh, division of the United States Army. And my belief is that the only Allied formation that beat it in terms of the number of days in combat was the second New Zealand Division, uh, who had started off in, in uh, North Africa in 1940, fought in Greece and Crete in 1941, 
right through the North African campaign and then the Italian campaign. And finally, uh, was, was the Allied uh, formation that went into Trieste to take the German surrender uh, at the end of April, beginning of May, 1945. Uh, so that's a, a very, very brief summary of uh, the division's activities with a concentration and what it did around uh, Casino in the first battle of Casino uh, in 1944. Needless to say, the, the um, conditions uh, and the casualties were horrendous. Uh, the, the different battalions, for example, uh, lost uh, enormous numbers of men at the end of their, their tour of duty on Phantom Ridge. The first battalion of 168th Infantry and only 154 effectives. Uh, the second battalion better off at 393, and the third battalion about 250. Uh, they, as I said, had gone into action on the 24th of January. Uh, we were relieved on the 11th and 13th of February, and uh, really they had lived a lifetime in hell in those few days. Um, in, in the mountains, and certainly having walked those mountains in pleasant weather, I take my hat off to the, the men of the Red Bull Division. So thank you very much for your attention, and that uh, finishes my contribution for the evening. Oh, thank you very much, Richard. I suppose before, I know I know Randall wants to come in um, and, and do a bit of, uh, talk a little bit about the, muse the, muse the Minnesota Military Museum and talk about what their plans are. But I thought maybe best before I do that, just if I want to open the floor to any questions, either for, for, for Doug or for Richard on the 34th, um, if you either want to put your, your questions into the chat um, and I can read them out, or if you want to raise your, I know there's a, there's a raise hand function and then we can, we can unmute you um, and you can ask your question directly um, to your speakers tonight. Give you a minute or so just to, if there's any questions. Um, well, I know in, in the meantime, well, if we wait for some questions, I know there was um, <laughs> certainly um, what actually, Doug, I think the one thing I sort of picked up on from, from what you were saying was about the, the helmets. I'd, I'd never actually heard that the, the reason behind that. So obviously I knew the, the distinction between the two styles and that the, the later contingents were wearing a different style, but I'd never actually heard before that the, the quartermaster refused to release them. So I, I thought that was, I was really, really actually the first time I've ever heard that. So. Yeah. Um, can you hear me? Yep. Yeah. So um, actually um, I, I'm the kind of history nerd that likes to read um, on government histories on really obscure subjects. And I'm, I'm reading the quartermaster history of the, the, um, the war against Germany right now. It's, a, it's part of the Army Green Book series. It's a big, thick book. And the quartermaster um, uh, officer over in, in England at the time uh, told the 34th Division, when you come over, wear your, your model 1917A1 helmets because um, the Ulster Defense Force in the Irish um, civilians in the area uh, might get worried if they see troops coming off a gangplank with helmets that look like German paratrooper helmets. And so um, the idea was to um, uh, have them wear helmets that had some familiarity with the British people. I don't know if that's true or not. Certainly the quartermaster corps at that time um, had the, 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 the more modern helmets available for them when they came over to Ireland, but they chose to um, have them come over in those British helmets which I thought was kind of an interesting little um, tidbit. A lot of people wonder why all those American soldiers are going over there in World War I uniforms. And, and um, th that kind of answered it for me when I read it the other day, so. Yeah, yeah no, it was, it was great to hear. It certainly stood out for me. Um, I know Ian Henderson. Ian, if you want to come in with a, a question. Um, not so much a question as just an observation. Um, there was rightly focus on Milburn Henke. And I just want to make the comment that back in 1992, when my wife and I were relatively young, um, Milburn and Iola 
came to dinner with us here in the the, oh. the house I'm I'm speaking from tonight, and the memories of of him as such a, a modest man, telling us how he got selected as the star turn of the American forces. He believes it's because he hadn't actually uh, committed any offences, and therefore nobody could could dig up any dirt on him, <laughs> and he got pushed forward as they were coming towards the gangplank. Um, and I think it probably is an example of the first specially selected man for this sort of thing, because as you know, he was later used uh, for fundraising and tours across the US and that sort of thing. So it was a very smart choice. And anyway, you, you the photographs and, and the occasion raised my memories of a very happy evening meal with him and Eola. So that's my two pennyworth. Can I can I briefly add another um, little tidbit to that story? When uh when they had chosen um Hanky to come down the gangplank, um, you've got to understand that most of the 133rd Regiment were from a state to the south of us called Iowa. Yes. Now, Minnesota and yes. Iowa have a little bit of a competition, right? And so Colonel Harder told the first sergeant to go pick out a a good looking guy to come down the gangplank and talk. Well, Milburn Hankey was probably um, one of about 10 guys from Minnesota in the 133rd Regiment. There's no way this guy could pick somebody that wasn't an Iowa one to come down the gangplank. And so when, when uh, Hankey came down the gangplank, the reporters asked him, what's your name or where are you from? Uh, Milburn Hankey from Hutchinson, Minnesota, which um, really deflated uh, the, the commander of the 133rd because he wanted to be uh, able to proclaim that an Iowan was the first one down the boat. So that's just a little aside to that story. But I think that's great that you were able to meet with Melbourne and, and um, Iola and, and uh, um, you tape recorded everything, right? So we have that on, on tape? Uh, sadly, no. Technology was not as advanced in those yeah. days. It's a fantastic story, though. Wonderful. I have a comment to make on that. And then also a question. Uh, my comment is, is that uh, I've read that that Hanky wasn't actually the first off the game plate. They had set up a ceremony on one of the docks uh, where <laughs> Hanky was photographed and, and uh, 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 was was designated as the first off the game plate. In fact, while this ceremony was taking place, but before it started, there was another group of GIs that departed, uh, an unnamed group that was marched right past them on, because they came off on the other dock. There were apparently uh, four ferries that were bringing uh, men in off of the boat. Uh, and, uh, and one of the other groups just marched right by the ceremony. And they were, in fact, the first ones. But uh, Milburn Hankey is the one who's gotten the credit over after all these years. The other, I have a question though. Uh, we know that the 34th trained in Northern Ireland, um, the first Ranger Division, which was organized uh, yep. and comprised uh, by a lot of the men from the 34th, also trained there initially. But I have not heard uh, of other units so I was wondering, were there other divisions or uh, substantial uh, U.S. units that trained in Northern Ireland? Yeah, certainly, Jack, it's, it's a great question. Um, no, I'm by no means an expert, and I'm sure Richard will, will pull me up on anything I say here. But um, the way the Americans in Northern Ireland sort of came in, in two waves. Um, the first um, with the 34th um, in the build-up to Operation Torch. In North Africa, and then the second wave in the build-up to the D-Day landings in '44. Um, just, um, I wouldn't be particularly off the top of my head, but certainly in the first wave, um, there was the, the first armored division. Elements of it were in based in Northern Ireland, um, and then more so in the, in the second wave, uh, I believe the Fifth Infantry Division were one of the major elements. Um, they were based in and around the Mourne Mountains in in the south uh, south of County Down. Um, as well as, I believe, I believe as well, the 8th Infantry Division, for that time, were based in Northern Ireland. Um, and it, it is worth stressing, it wasn't just the US Army that were based in Northern Ireland. 
and um, there's very large um, US Army Air Force presence in Northern Ireland, um, as well as a, a civilian presence. So the Lockheed Overseas Corporation had a very large um, base on the shores of Loch Ness um, called um, Langford Lodge. Um, and the US Navy also a, a quite a large presence, um, which up in, in Derry, London Derry, um, it would have been the, 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 the British end of the, the convoy um, system. Um, where there's a, a US naval operating base was based um, on, on Loch Foil at London Derry. Um, but I'd, I'd like to invite Richard to maybe come in because I know um, he might have something to say about the who actually was the first Americans to arrive, um, certainly as, as, a, as somebody from um, London Derry. Well, the, the, the convoy that uh, brought uh, 30, the, the first flight of 34th Division, uh, the, the, um, the RMS Strathaird, uh, or as she was during the Second World War, the hired military transport, Strathaird. Uh, it, it actually was a two-ship convoy escorted by two warships of, of the Royal Navy. And a lot of the records say that the ships went into Glasgow. Of course, they didn't go into Glasgow, but one of them went into Belfast and the other one, either directly itself or by using tenders, uh, came into London Derry. So there are US soldiers ashore in Northern Ireland, in barracks, in Londonderry, before that ship arrives in the Pollock Dock in Belfast. Uh, and as I say, I emphasize it's the first flight, it's not the entire division uh, by, by any means. And the fact that you can see them using 25 pounder guns means that they don't have their own uh, American equipment at that stage. Uh, Land lease uh, worked in, in two ways. Uh, all the facilities for the U.S. forces in the United Kingdom were paid for by the U.K. taxpayer, not the American taxpayer. Uh, and that, that was our part of paying off something uh, against, uh, against the generosity of the United States government, uh, which has to be said is probably one of the greatest acts of generosity uh, in, in the history of mankind. Uh, thank you, Richard. Um... There's another question for you, Doug, from um, Ian McConnell. He asks it's in, the, in the chat if you've received photos of U.S. vehicles in Northern Ireland, specifically Dodge weapons carriers. Um, he, he mentions he has one with no unit markings, which you would like to find a photo of one with a Northern Ireland connection. We, we have a lot of photographs in our archives. Um, a lot of them, we, honestly, we haven't even gone through yet, but um, I'm sure somewhere in our collections, we have pictures of, of Dodge weapons carriers. Um, as I'm just going through Colonel Sylvester's collection that was dropped off in our lap, um, he's got hundreds of photographs and he had hundreds of high quality photographs. There may very well be some weapons carriers in there. Um, we have a lot of private soldiers that brought cameras with them to Northern Ireland and we're taking pictures. So um, there's there's that chance that we have that stuff. It's just something you'll, you'll have to maybe email me and send me a request and, and we can, um, uh, working with our archivist, Dan Ewer, we can probably come up with some pictures for you, so. Um, Ian, I'll just drop Doug's email into the chat then so you can see it. Um, so, um, then, and then Randall, just if there's no more questions. So do you wanna come in and just say a very quick word about the museum and your, your future plans and so on? Be happy to. Thank you. Um, you know, just for a minute or two, um, thank you for having us on this evening. Um, hope we hope we do this again. Uh, this is an important story to to, to move forward. Um, Doug talked about the, the 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 environment at Camp Claiborne, which is about 1,600 kilometers south of Minnesota in Louisiana, uh, at the opposite end of the Mississippi uh, in the United States. Um, for your reference, if you're wanting to do some more research to understand uh, the kind of character that this unit had the 34th um, on YouTube, uh, there's a Harold C. Deutsch roundtable you can find on YouTube, <laughs> uh, packed with all kinds of uh, roundtable interviews, and one of them is is with this individual, uh, Archie uh, Chewsbury, and, and he does a tremendous job of, of providing some real color to this group. Um, they were uh, it was a hardworking, fun-loving group uh, who loved to sing songs and were funny um, in lots of ways. But they they grew up on the farms, uh, and and they carried that, that 
um, kind of small town farm life with them to Northern Ireland and, and through North Africa and, and Italy. So check that out if you want to do some more research, but uh, it's a great resource. Um, one of the people that spoke along with Archie um, on that round table and that Doug made mention of uh, was John Vesey pictured here. Um, and John Vesey was a Minnesotan. And as Doug mentioned, he was uh, a 46 year military career uh, ends up being um, the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff for Ronald Reagan, really at the, the, arguably the height of the Cold War, and speaks uh, repeatedly about what he experienced and learned uh, in World War II, and, that how, and then how that informed uh, his leadership of the armed forces years later, and, and how that changed um, the readiness of uh, the American military as a result of what he yeah. saw. Uh, when he was part of the 34th and landed in in, in Ireland and, and did become you know the, the four star general, he passed away in 2016. Uh, his grave is actually uh, at the at the front door essentially of of Camp Ripley. Um, there was a understanding where we come from, being proud of of his service um, to Minnesota and the country and in arguably the world, especially you know working with the Reagan administration in the 80s. Uh, there was a comprehensive um, oral history project done with Dr. Thomas Saylor uh, sitting down with uh, General Vesey for many, many hours, resulting in about a 700 page uh, oral history of, of his time. And he talks in that oral history about arriving in Northern Ireland. And if you'll allow me just you know, a, a minute perhaps, um, he references it and, and, and thought it was kind of uh, maybe a, a nice way to wrap up. Um, as the, the interviewer in this case, uh, Dr. Thomas Saylor is asking him um, what the, how the population in Northern Ireland, how they responded or felt about the Americans suddenly landing. And, um, you know, John's reply, and I'll offer two of them, um, is John says in the oral history interview that I'm reading from, I think it was a great strain in the population. The saying generally in the British Isles, um, was that there were a couple of things wrong with the Americans, or three things to be more exact. Uh, they were overpaid, oversexed, and over here. Uh, and then the interview goes on. Uh, Thomas Saylor in, uh, asks him the follow-up question: if if he ever felt that that um, you know this was a burden in some ways, um, providing and demanding an awful lot from the population to support these American GIs. And uh, he says no. Never, I was never treated better as a soldier in any civilian community than I was in Northern Ireland, which if you understand General Vesey's 46 year uh, military career, um, you understand what he's saying, because um, he's been around the world and it treated with all the very best care meeting dignitaries and politicians and everybody and presidents along with them. Um, and for him to, to single out, um, no place was he treated better as a soldier than you know in Northern Ireland. I thought that was telling, you know, buried in a 700 page oral history done five years ago is General Vesey saying, um, you know, Northern Ireland um, was good to him and good to the GIs. Um, he goes on to say um, that when they were leaving, uh, it was supposed to be a big secret um, about when they were going to be departing. Uh, and General Vesey is a closing comment for you all um, says, um, we were welcomed here and when we left, it was a book, supposed to be a big secret that we were leaving, but they knew we were leaving and the people knew that we were leaving and, and they, gave us a, a, they gave us their rations as a farewell dinner for the NCOs in our unit. So, uh, you know, a send off dinner uh, that was supposed to be secret. And of course, um, the, the generosity perhaps um, that was displayed, um, you know, couldn't, couldn't keep that secret. Uh, and, and I think the appreciation um, of General Vesey and of the Minnesota troops um, and American GIs to uh, Northern Ireland is to be noted. Um, we are at Camp Ripley, our museum is, we've been there for 40 years. You saw some images that Doug shared of, of uh, the 53 acre, 53,000 acre campus that is Camp Ripley. Um, we're building a, a new facility. Uh, we've been at a small facility depicted here in the upper left uh, and, and then filling an awful lot of these overhead views of smaller buildings on this large campus. Um, for the last, you know, since 1977, when the museum was formed, um, we've, we're in the process of, of 
pulling together all the funding and the design work to construct this new facility you see pictured here. This is a rendering for a new facility to open in 2024, early 2025 potentially, uh, right outside the gates of Camp Ripley, adjacent to the Mississippi River, um, and one that we're proud of. So uh, overhead view here, um, from the other perspective you just saw on the top of the page, essentially you see a, a cemetery denoted and a walkway to that cemetery. Uh, that lovely uh, cemetery, veteran cemetery is where General Vesey and his wife Avis are buried. Um, certainly some interior shots as well. Uh, but this facility, a rendering at the moment, but one that we're working hard uh, in Minnesota uh, to create and, and share the stories of the 34th and their time in Northern Ireland uh, and, and noting that the Red Bull uh, division, um, you know, stretches back to World War I, but even uh, as recently as, you know, the end of the American presence in Afghanistan uh, have continued to really serve with distinction. Um, and so I really appreciate uh, the chance to share these stories with you and, and hope we can uh, continue the conversation, Alan and Richard. Oh, thank you very much, Randall. Um, it certainly looks to be a, a very exciting um, time and very exciting future for your, yourselves. With the, I'm, I'm sure that the project, um, well, I hope it all goes very smoothly over the next year. Um, I might have to ask Richard and the rest of the trustees here for maybe a, uh, an all expenses paid trip to Minnesota within the next five, 10 years, maybe. Count on that. <laughs> uh, so, but yes, thank you very much, guys. Um, unless there's any final questions? I think we will probably best to call the night, let you guys get your lunch and we can all go home and get our dinner as well. Thank Wonderful. you very much. Thank you very much. Thank and you. I'll, I'll touch base with you all shortly. Thank, Thank you, you once you again. Did. Thank you. Bye-bye.